Hi, my name is Peter. I'm an emergency um, physician uh, in residency, um, originally from Denmark and working in Stockholm. And today I want to talk with you about, um, or today I will give you a lecture that I gave to our um, in internal medicine um, colleagues at our hospital. Um, or sadly, there were some technical problems, and, and that's why I'm uploading it here, so that um, all of you guys can see it here uh, in your comfortable uh, homes <laughs> instead of uh, being at the hospital. Um, I was, I, I wanted to do a, a lecture uh, where we talk about these topics, not from a general perspective, but from because you guys will get that from cardiologists or pulmonologists and so on, and you, you know much more about a lot of these issues than I actually do. Um, but I will do it from an, from the perspective of an emergency physician and what I want um, all of our like um, all of our residents in emergency medicine to know about. Um, I'm trying to explain it um, in a way so that uh, other specialties also can can follow along. So I'll do um, the first um, the first part of this lecture is on chest pain and uh, or at least chest pain as a framework, and I will talk uh, about probabilistic thinking uh, in chest pain. And uh, in the second half, I will talk about dyspnea. And at th that point, I will talk more about the um, how to do with critically ill patients and some some non-technical skills um, that are useful. Okay, so let's get started. As always, these are some of the best references I know. To, uh, if you're not, um, if you don't know about decision making or haven't looked at the literature about that, um, then this is a good way to go into this uh, area, especially from an emergency medicine perspective. Um, I will highlight all of these, like this is the creme de la creme, I think, but I will highlight that uh, quite recently there was this mastering diagnosis in first 10 EM, which is also free, that I highly recommend looking at. And uh, uh, I've made, I also made some videos uh, about this, uh, or several videos about this. Or if you look at the YouTube channel, you'll see different um uh, videos on on this topic as well but if you want to hear it from someone who's better at english and who is uh, more an expert more of an expert in this area than i am then check out some of these links yeah all right so when we're talking about chest pain or any other symptom in emergency medicine um, and the decisions that goes into that, because that is what we're going to talk about. How do we make decisions in these patients? How do we make decisions whether they should be treated and how they should be treated or whether or not they should go home or not, whether or not they're low risk or high risk? Before we go into that, we, uh, then we need to kind of figure out what is the purpose of emergency medicine. And because as like everything revolves around what the patient what is best for the patient in, in in every kind of medicine right and also in emergency medicine so i'm not useful if i'm not useful to the patient if i'm not getting something giving the patient something more than than if if um uh, the like the, the specialities were in the emergency department taking care of their own patients uh, in quote unquote own own patients um then 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 i do, then i didn't need to be there if i didn't add anything to it um and i think that's that's the, like that that's the that's the main thing that we have to like that's where we have to start with all conversations about well whether emergency medicine is, is relevant is it good for the patients also when we do procedures should we intubate and so on is it good for the patients and it, it depends on the setting right it depends on where you're working and where you are and whether you're working rural or, or urban. And if we take the example of intubation, well, is it important to, like, <laughs> we shouldn't do it just because it's a cool procedure that we think it's cool to do. That's like, as John Hines say, are, are our uh, intentions honorable when we're doing these things? And if they're not honorable, if we're doing it for our, our sake, only and not for the patient's sake, then then it's then we shouldn't be doing it. And on the intubation uh, discussion, I land where I think, um, like I, I don't I don't think we should be doing it because in 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 our setting, because in Scandinavia we always have a a better person, an anesthesiologist who actually does this every day. Um, we have them close by, 
uh, and only in situations where they cannot reach us we should do it and there there's a few situations one of which i will come back to in the end of this lecture but so we need to start what is the purpose of of, of me of as an emergency um, physician and I've always boiled it down to this. And if you want to look into it more, you can check out, for instance, Ruben Strayer or uh, Atkinson and Inns uh, in the references to check out what uh, what, the, what is the purpose of emergency medicine. You can check out Scott Weingart on uh, on is medicine is emergency medicine a failed paradigm? His lecture on SMAC um, and so on. So, but I think it boils down to these three things, which are in, interacting in a complex way. So. The main thing that we're going to talk about today is the time critical thing. We want someone, no matter how you present with an emergent pr problem, to be able to sort out whether whether it's time critical or not, or actually reduce the risk of it being time critical, or if it's time critical or we cannot rule it out, then admit and treat. That's our main purpose, right? And then the other things that comes into emergency medicine that we won't be talking too much about today is is um, numbers needed to treat equals one. What I have an entire lecture on called compassionate care, but the, but the essence is uh, we shouldn't um, like the main focus of any doctor is to make the patient better as a as a product of our interaction with the patient. They shouldn't become worse. Or at least they shouldn't. Uh, they, at least they shouldn't become worse as, as a product of meeting us, right? And uh, NNT equals one, um, and it, it 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 connotates that um, if we have a treatment as like a normal treatment would be normally need to treat maybe thirty or forty. You need to treat forty or thirty patients for that treatment to have like to to give some kind of benefit for one pay per, in person. That's what the NNT means, right? Um, an NNC of one means it's like kind of a mental way of saying compassionate care or your interaction with the patient just by being the doctor patient interaction, you can make the patient better. Um, doesn't mean you have to fix their problem. Doesn't mean that you have to, to, um, to like, um, treat their illness, um, because sometimes it's untreatable or unmanageable or they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, but you need to, um, be compassionate you need uh, or try to be compassionate and you need to um, try to um, help the patient in front of you to get to the next step in their treatment and that, that might be just writing down a note for them with three plans that they have to to uh, to figure out um, so that they leave the emergency department with something so that they, it wasn't a waste of time for them um, and that doesn't have to be much but oftentimes what we think is what we consider not much is often quite a lot for the patients so take the time to do that and if you want to go into that check out my lecture on on compassionate care and and also the probabilistic headache, headache lecture the middle one is is the a kind of counterweight to being with the patient in front of you that is emergency medicine especially but also medicine in general is a zero-sum game um, if I spend more patient, more more time on one patient, then I'll spend less time on another one. And this is all about the flow metrics, and and how to how to um, ethically um, <laughs> to do what we do in emergency medicine. Uh, we do triage, right? And but sometimes the ones that are triaged the lowest are actually the sickest. So so we need some kind of complex um, um, weighing between numbers needed to treat equals one and and while well, well, treating the one in front of you and treating all of the others in the waiting room and knowing that we're not missing anything because that is the time critical thing. So they, inter they interact in, in complex ways and sometimes one of them gives priority to another depending on the context and so on. So that's what I think we do in emergency medicine um, in a short <laughs> in a short uh, talk here. But we'll talk more about the uh, especially the time critical, um, the time criticalness of, of these things, and because when we talk about chest pain as it, as is the topic in this first part, um, it's all about ruling out or ruling in the dangerous stuff. That is what we care about. We kind of have a what we would call a needle in a haystack problem in in emergency medicine, and a lot of these things are also carrying over to. Um, primary care but, but primary care the, the, I guess the haystack is much bigger and the the needles are much fewer depending on where you work of course but 
in general, um, we have a haystack where we need to find the needle because most of the patients, even though they have presented with symptoms that may be serious, usually they, they're not. Um, if you present with thunderclap headache, um, uh, at least 90% of you, 90% uh, of the patients will not have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and maybe 70% of them, depending on, the, like, if you ask Jonathan Etlow, then one of the experts in the area in emergency medicine, then he will say maybe 70% of them will not have anything serious, even though you have a thunderclap headache. Um, and then we can discuss how we define that and how we get that information from the patient, uh, evaluating that they have it. But that's another story. But in general. On the, on the face of it, we always have many, many more who present with a symptom who, ha, who, who doesn't have any problem, actually, or don't have any serious time-critical problem that we need to take care of right now, where we can use the time as a test, which is the default, right? Most things go over uh, without any interventions, right? That's that's our luck in, in general in medicine. <laughs> um, so... Um, and we want to do this without, like, we want to find this person without burning all of the hay, without without, without over diagnosing and over treating all the other patients, right? So we could we could order CC scans on everyone, but we don't do that. We because that would be cost ineffective. That would be painful and hurtful to the patients. Um, just to save one, it's kind of the um, the trolley problem. Uh, uh, like, how do we do? We want to save one to say to uh, and 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 then on the cost of all the others. So that's our that's uh, uh, one of the like main problems in emergency or or um, challenges in emergency medicine, and we will always I sometimes draw this picture with a hit rate right. We will always hit one if we want to just just find every time we do a scan we we find this, this disease, and and every then 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 if, if we have a hit rate of 100 percent then then usually that's impossible right statistically speaking so then usually we are under under utilizing that test we need to, to test more so we will always because of sensitivity and specificity we will always have to do more um more tests than than just to find one person but we shouldn't do it so that all of these are, are hurt by it. We should we should like try to minimize our hit rate so that it, it so that it, it's in balance, right? So we find some negatives and some positives, but not a hit rate of one to hundred or something like that for CT scans, right? So we want to do this without burning the hay. So how do we do that? We do that by being clever about it, by being good diagnosticians, expert diagnosticians in the in the in the presentation of symptoms in emergency medicine. And that is what our expertise is, or one of our core things. And that's what I want to spend some time talking about, what the theory about that is. Thanks, All right. I usually show this picture as well, because we have this This challenge goes along with this other challenge that is this is in, in primary care and in, in emergency medicine. Because if we see someone in the emergency uh, department, the, the condition would not usually have developed so much. And if we see them the day after or the day after uh, that uh, and so on, then usually the disease manifestation is much more um, it's much more um, um, clear, right? And sometimes you can go from here and say, oh, why did they do that in the emergency department? Or we can go from the emergency department and say, oh, why did they do that in the primary care sector? And that's called hindsight bias. It doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes, but it means that a mistake in emergency medicine, as we'll come back to, is much more about the process of thinking and what kind of data we we uh, thought was um, uh, appropriate to acquire uh, for this particular patient, and that we analyzed that. And so we got, got we gathered all the data that we needed. We analyzed it in an appropriate way because we shouldn't analyze everything all the time because that's also harmful to all the others in the waiting room, right? Um, and 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 wasteful. So we need this kind of balance, and we so we so there is this kind of balance thing in our data collection. We and we collect our data, and we from the symptoms that we found. Then we we didn't have a um, high enough clinical suspicion of the disease, but we have a cl high enough clinical um, high, high enough um, clinical suspicion to maybe admit them. Or sometimes we, as we will come back to, also sometimes we treat a condition that is much 
less likely, but it's the time critical condition that we need to rule out and we haven't ruled out yet and can't rule out. Then we have to treat it or at least admit to observe, observe for it, even though it's much, much, much more likely that it was something minor. Um, an example would be of, of this kind of thinking is here, uh, I, 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 um, uh, at one time I met a patient in the emergency department that had a, um, a very swollen calf and uh, I didn't get any history from him really because he was kind of delirious, uh, an older um, person. Uh, and, and I mean, it didn't quite look like a normal like cellulitis. I looked at with ultrasound. There was no gas. There was no, um, there was no abscess, and it was kind. Of, it was more tender than I would think it was usually, but it wasn't that tender, and it it was like kind of localized on his calf and wasn't doing anything. So I drew, drew around a um a, with a uh, with a sharpie. I, I drew around the, the red area, and then I admitted him for um with with IV penicillin for cellulitis and then uh, like cultures and like what you would usually do for someone who's maybe pre-septic. Um and then on the next day, uh, I could read the notes that um he was uh, now the, the redness has in, had increased and he was he was in in, uh, in shock. And and you could like that that doctor who saw saw him on the wars uh, the day after could easily go back to, uh, and, and say like oh he made a mistake in the emergency department but as long as I had on my map or on my time critical differential uh, the um, that I thought of oh could this be necrotocyte and fasciitis could this be toxic shock syndrome could this be compartment syndrome could could this be these the 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 most likely time critical conditions from what I saw. Could it be any of those? If it, and I, I, I could say like clinically, those are really hard to rule out. It's usually the time as a test, and that works there. And I, I didn't think they were. He was above a threshold that I had to do a um, a, to put a needle into him and, and or, or or a knife into him and, and see if anything, um, um, any any kind of um, gray matter came out, which is a test for necrotizing fasciitis. I, I didn't think he was over that over that threshold. I, I was I think I thought I thought it more likely to be an atypical presentation of cellulitis, but as time went by, it, it became more obvious that it wasn't. It probably was either toxic shock syndrome or it was uh, necrotizing fasciitis, and so that, that's just the, the kind of thinking. Like it's the data that we have and, and within reason can collect at the time. Um, that that is uh, the like the, is the decision based on that, not the treatment and not the outcome. That is important. That, that is most important for us. And when we hear cases, we should always look at them prospectively, give data, and see what other people would have done, instead of looking at at it from 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 a retrospective scope, right? Okay. And it comes back to these things. Uh, so now we're getting into this. What is emergency medicine and what is this essence, essence of our thinking? And that's what we call probabilistic thinking. And some of the, the mantras uh, are coming up here. Patients don't have diseases. They only have probability of diseases. And the probability is pushed up and down by our tests. And how much they're pushed up, pushed up and down depends on how good the test is. And how good is the test? It depends on the sensitivity and specificity of the test. But we don't like the specificity and the sensitivity of tests. Because... Um, if I say that you have a sensitivity and specificity of maybe 99%, that most would agree that that's a good test. But if I test a population where uh, where the disease that I'm looking for is has a prevalence of one in a million, then it's then I'm going to have a lot even with the best of tests like that. I'm going to have a lot of false positives. And if you want to like do the calculations and check out the first 10 EM. Uh, lecture that I uh, I hinted at in the beginning, he he does the calculations. But in general, I, I don't think you need to necessarily need to do the calculations. I mean, an example that we often see in the literature is oh, if someone tests positive from from a from a breast cancer screening test, like a mammography and triple diagnostics, and um, what are the, the most what are the precise probability or what is this, what is the likelihood that uh, how many will actually turn out to have cancer and like because it's such a low risk population you have mo many many more false positives um and then you have false negatives uh, so sorry then you have true positives and that means that you will have uh, like 
far and wide um, a lot of um, many, many, many more false positives and true positives in such a population, even though the test has a sensitivity of 99 and, and, and specificity of 99. Um, so the test really depends on the prevalence of the disease in the condition in, 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 in your in your population. So um so 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 tests are not just tests and it depends on where they have been tested, so to speak, to know to know their sensitivity and specificity. That's in another discussion that I won't go into, but in general, just to put a point put a pin in that uh, to put a pin in, in that, I, I want to say that um, sensitivity and specificity we need to know the studies that they came from. If they came from an emergency department done by a, an emergency physician, then I can use it very well. If it's from an outpatient, if it's from an outpatient clinic uh, by another kind of expert, then I probably should be worried about whether I could uh, I could perform it, whether I have the same intrauterine reliability, whether it actually um, uh, fits with our kind of patients, right? Um, in this like early disease disease manifestation usually so so that's why um, but but what I wanted to go, get at is sensitivity and specificity is kind of hard to to work with in clinical practice we need to know what you call likelihood ratios which can be directly calculated from from um, the sensitivity and specificity which I'll get into now uh, in, in in a few slides so what I'm doing now is I'm kind of, if you're working in the emergency department, which most of you are um, from time to time, and um, then you only see a part of it. And you may think that you uh, have become an expert just by working there. And that's a fallacy that, that we often see, uh, like we all are, are, are capable of, of, of falling into. Um, because we think just the amount of hours working somewhere makes you an expert, and it, it doesn't. That's the, the definition of like that, that's what we think about like what the concept of deliberate practice. You need to kind of like you, you need to know what what you what you what what you have a hard time at in the emergency department or at whatever you're trying to become an expert at, and then become better and better and better at those things. But if you just expose yourself, uh, then then you don't necessarily become an expert. You become you usually become better but not an expert until you actually get some kind of feedback or a deliberate practice. Um, that's another lecture I'll have done as well. So I'll, so you may be seeing this small part of the emergency department, how it works. And, and uh, I'm going to lift the veil here and see if there's a few more things that I, I can try to uh, show you and teach you. Not that I'm not, not that I'm a fully developed expert at all in, in this area, but um, I'll try to show you a bit, a bit more of our world and see if it, maybe next time you're in the emergency department, you can kind of um, either discuss it with us or, or kind of get into our, the way we think about this, about this and see if it's useful, useful for you. All right, so chest pain. Um, I often draw this to like make like every time I see a patient or every time I uh, do like do cases as we will do here, I usually draw this diagram. Time critical, not time critical. Likely and unlikely. Diagnoses, right? Or differential diagnoses. So we, if I see it, um, and at, and we can do this at different times during the encounter with the patient. We can do it before we see the patient, like at time zero. Before I see a patient in the emergency department, which diagnosis would I want to rule out, right? What are the time critical and likely? These are the ones I'm interested in. Um, and in chest pain, we have these maybe six conditions, uh, the, the big six, uh, sometimes called the big five or, or the big six, depends. But usually, I, I usually remember it by, there are two heart conditions, so it's ACS, and there are all of the, like within ACS, you also have your minocas and you have all of the other things, right? Um, your o OMI, your, uh, your uh, NOMI, you know me and omis you have like everything in there then you have um with chest pain you also have uh, the other heart condition which is perimyocarditis including pregnancy postpartum myocarditis and so on and so forth right um so those are the two heart conditions then we need four more the four are the four other ones are there are two lung conditions pneumothorax and um pulmonary embolism right so those are those are the two lung conditions and then you have um then you have your uh, two odd ones, um, 
the first uh, odd one is um, aortic uh, acute aortic syndrome or or dissection, and the other one is your upper GI, which uh, includes pancreatitis, uh, ulcer. Um, uh, Borg-Harvey syndrome, like esophageal rupture, and so on. And of course, there are certain things that may sometimes not be time critical, but may move over to the time critical one, and like like pneumonia sometimes, and maybe mediastinitis as well. That's a sep zebra, right? Unlikely, but some often time critical before you're seeing the patients, right? But usually they will present by the workup of the other conditions, right? You will usually work up a condition. If if you have a pneumonia that is severe, time critical, then usually they will come in in a bad way, uh, being dyspneic. Uh, and usually, if you have an, uh, a a mediastinitis, they will usually come in being septic or something, or or have some kind of rupture in there. So usually by these big six you will usually find out anyway um but of course if 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 the patient looks bad and you, you don't have a diagnosis yet then you will have to consider some of the other uh, conditions all right all right then i usually when i draw this so i draw this diagram at that's that, 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 that's at time zero we have these six conditions that could be time critical and unlikely but then as we move into the patient's encounter we let them sit down, uh, we sit down and they, we ask them a broad question and they tell, their, their, tell us their story. Um, then we kind of, in our mind, we sort away some of these um, uh, conditions, um, or at least we have arrows going up and down, right? We have likelihood ratios of all things going up and down and we get this kind of broad picture of what is it actually the problem, what is the problem today? Is it actually chest pain or is it something else? Do I have to think about think about it? Could be back pain and chest pain, and like if it's a pain that start like is in the flank, then sometimes I have to have multiple like syndrome differentials in my head. It could be back pain, it could be flank pain, like with the abdomen, it could be chest pain, and with all their differentials at the same time, right? So, so some, we need to know what the problem is. And sometimes we can't get past that. We just have to move on and do some tests to see. Sometimes we have to work up three things at once. Right, so but as much as we can narrow it down by them telling us the story and what is what is the problem, what is the purpose of being here today? That's really important. Why did they come in today? Did they come in because they now feel really bad? That's that's always something that we need to like consider. Um, um, uh, but if if the patient had what what was at their primary care physician today. Uh, at a yearly or biannual control and then they just happened to take an ECG or just happened to do some blood works that show that oh he has a high blood pressure or he had had something then I'm not too worried because usually or probably they, they they're asymptomatic right they, they, they haven't been been um, uh, they've been walking around with this condition for a long time, right? So even though their blood pressure maybe had 220, oh no, <laughs> but they don't have any headache, they don't have any symptoms of it. And yes, it should be lowered if it's actually high blood pressure, right? Um, and not just a white coat hypertension. So we could hurt our patients by sometimes them sending them in, and we not if we're not considering what there are, what is their baseline risk here? All right. Um, so it's important to know why they're here as this part, like as as this starting point in the in the conversation with the patient but let's say at a time maybe 15 20 minutes or something like that when we have gathered some uh, some data and gathered some history and we, we we've gotten to the, the doctor's part where we ask specific questions and we do specific tests then we then, then we may have sorted off some of uh, several of these and 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 then maybe only two or three are left right and then the last two or three that we have to do some kind of test if we're still not sure whether we can rule out or not I will say this as well uh, as the last thing in this slide that these things that are not time critical that these, those are usually the ones that everyone working in the emergency department that comes and consults us thinks oh this is probably just pneumonia and or this is just probably just musculoskeletal pain and so on and that's yes that is the most likely thing most things like mo most conditions or so, sorry most presentations that patients have in the emergency department they the cause of them are usually unknown and multifactorial and bio, biosocial, biopsychosocial. That's that's almost all the time. But what I want to know is the the however, like, are we above a threshold for 
for these time critical conditions. And 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 there is one there is one time where I actually am interested in these musculoskeletal pains and so on. And that is when like from a perspective of numbers needed to treat equals one, that 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 I, I like trying to reduce the pain and suffering of the patient. That's I'm 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 very I'm very interested in that as well. But from the time critical perspective, I'm not interested in this unless I have a really really good test that can rule this one in, like say that this is definitely it, but and and therefore ruling this out. As long as the patient has just one cause one condition that is the cause of their symptom and that's always a, a consideration but if you're young then usually you don't have both acs and pneumonia you usually have just one of them but at the older you get you can have s several causes of one symptom um but my usual example is if you have dizziness then then if you have um uh, if you have dizziness, and sometimes it can be hard to rule out a stroke. I've made several videos on how to do that, but it can sometimes be a bit tricky. And if, if but if you get a, a clearly positive BPV test like the whole pike, where the where, where the nystagmus goes exactly as it should, um, then the reason that like the likelihood goes way up for BPV and thereby also goes way down for this. Um, Assuming that they don't have two conditions, and 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 they do, they it's it's rare to have two conditions for, but but sometimes you just have to know about that. That's the that's the assumption. Okay, but but for chest pain, musculoskeletal pain, oh, I'm pushing on the chest. We know that even if I can reproduce the entire, like if I can reproduce the entire pain in a young person and their ECG is normal, then it's all right. But if it's an older person, person where they like most older persons at baseline will have a lot of uh, like chest pain if, it, if you're pushing on the chest if you've ever done ultrasound on a chest on an older pa patient you shouldn't you don't have to push a lot to like induce uh, severe pain for them even for young patients so a lot of us are kind of tender in our, our chest and and we shouldn't use that as a test um, um, unless it's like just an, at a one single point and it reproduces everything and it's with movement and so on so, so it's really like bulk, so, 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 yeah, musculoskeletal pain and also reflux disease. All of these things that we cannot actually diagnose don't, like, yes, that is the most likely thing. But there's no real, like, have you ruled out these? Then I'm, then I'm content. Then it's all right. But gastroenteritis in an older patient, well, well, yeah, it might be the reason for the vomiting. But have you thought about mesenteric ischemia? Have you thought about the other things? And it's okay. You don't have to work work it up all the time. Just I I, I, need to, I need to be convinced that is the and then oftentimes the tests over here are not convincing. It's something that we just like. What is the definition? What is the gold standard of pneumonia? What is the gold standard of gastroenteritis? Well, it's a it's a culture of gastroenteritis, right? It's a in pneumonia. I don't even know <laughs> kind of what is the like. That's a that's an almost ethical discussion. What is the um, what is the pneumo, what is pneumonia's definition? Like um, that's a rabbit hole to go down. But so 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 I'm I'm more like we always need to think about these things uh, in emergency medicine, and that's why we will continue to do that when we are cons being consulted by you, and see that have you ruled out these these things, and it doesn't have to be by any CT scan. You, sometimes it's all right with with just, but you have to consider them, okay? And we know when we're doing our S bar, when you're doing our S bar to us, we can hear. Through the S bar, through the way that the the the, the, the words that you or the or the, um, the questions that you ask the patient and the way that you ask the patients and the way that you present these questions or this summarization in the S bar to us, we can hear that you've have you thought about this or have you thought about this. Sometimes we we hear it and sometimes we don't. So the S bar is kind of a canary in the coal mine when we when we hear um, when we, we for 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 the way uh, like for the way you think about these these things. All right. Yeah, so always consider these. Um, these can be important if we have a high specific test for them. Uh, these are not irrelevant. And these, I mean, sepras or sepras are, um, as a phenomenon, something that is unlikely. And oftentimes, like the mantra is, well, it's more, um, it's probably more common to have a um, atypical presentation of something um, normal than having something uh, like than having a zebra as a, as a, as a reason for the condition, but I guarantee you, 
any day in the emergency department, one SEPRA is being diagnosed. It might not be the specific SEPRA that you're thinking of, but SEPRAs or uncommon things are common. Not just, but, but just not the specific uncommon thing that you are thinking of, right? Um, so so the SEPRAs are out there, and there's this kind of cognitive bias called SEPRA retreat, retreat that we should think about, if, um, that we'll talk about later. If we're not, if we're not all, if we're not sometimes considering this, and when should we consider this? Well, especially when we have a spe special group of patients. If you have a Mar Mar Marfang patient, then we should kind of consider strange things. Or you have a patient who has had a lot of strange things happen to them, disease-wise. Then sometimes, yeah, this may be an an, an outlier patient, and then, or if our workup is, uh, we're still worried about the patient, but it doesn't really. It doesn't really seem like this, and uh, and we release runs out, and it, it doesn't really seem like these. Then we have to consider these, right? Okay, so we have this concept of illness scripts in emergency medicine. When we're listening to the story, when we, uh, like if we talk about chest pain, the big six, then as emergency physicians, we could we could kind of plan out all of the all of the symptoms that we know like chest pain and headache and abdominal pain and, and leg pain and, and dizziness and, and, and neurological deficits and so on. And from them, we could say, take all, like do the, what, what we just did and do a diagram of the time critical conditions uh, within reason. And then we can plot them out and do a sum of them, which Ruben Strayer, Ruben Strayer has done in this EM update uh, YouTube uh, video, which is great. Uh, check that out if you want. It's really, really great. And... Um, um, we call either each of these a, a condition, like like an illness, or we can have an illness script of each of these. And an illness script is like kind of the um, the main information that we need to know as emergency physicians. And I'm I that's one of the things I have to be expert in. I have to know some of all of these, like some of the conditions. I'm sure you all know, like like uh, like um, aortic dissection or ACS. But I also have to know uh, like um, Let's say uh, acute angle glaucoma, uh, or uh, or like a TOA, like a tubal tubal ovarian abscess, and so on. Like the different conditions for different presentations that are time critical, and it's a finite number. Um, so we do these. So we, and 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 what we want to know is like the epidemiology like how common is the condition because that's the basis of the pretest probability most of the conditions that we see in the emergency department are quite rare like it's the needle in the haystack we want to find the needle and sometimes the needles are really really small like with headache and sinus venous thrombosis central sinus venous thrombosis cvst it's a really really small needle and it's a really really common condition headache so that's uh, <laughs> we need to know that because um because that's how, as we'll see in a, in a moment, that's how we evaluate the pre-test probability and how common or how good the test has to be to actually rule it in. We need to know what, which kind of tests are good or not good um, and which tests actually distinguish between, like if we have two conditions we are considering, oh, I, I consider aortic dissection and, chest, uh, and, and ACS. Okay, what kind of tests can I do that actually distinguishes these two and if i don't have any test that distinguishes these two then i should go to the like then i have to do the the big test the ct scan to rule out this the the, the uh, to rule it out right but sometimes there are, are, are tests maybe an ecg with a specific sign as we'll go into hint hint um, maybe an ecg with a specific sign can show something that will be distinct that, that can reliably distinguish between the aortic dissection and acs so we need to both know the tests for the specific condition, but we also need to know kind of the tests that could like um, most commonly distinguish between two very common conditions that present in the same um, with the same symptom. Um, we need to know the treatments because that's important for our thresholds. Like if we don't have a good treatment or we don't have, don't have a good um, diagnostic test, then then as we go into then the test threshold is is different and we need to know that also we need to just inform the patient of it and see how good the test and some tests are really good sometimes in our in the books you will have a like in, if you're in a critical 
condition, like if the patient isn't in a critical condition, I usually use the example of upper GI bleeds. If you have an upper GI bleed and your patient don't, uh, then, then there's like a big list of things that you can do. But in the critical patient, um, Nexium or uh, PPIs will not help your patient because the numbers needed to treat there is like both the evidence is really weak if if uh, like is really re there are evidence and and, and they, it's negative or really weak um and then then that's what we call opportunity cost in emergency medicine like i can do all of the 10 things that i should do in opportunity i believe but which one is most important right now at the critical like in, with the patient in front of me um well that's the th that's the one that has the lowest number needed to treat and that would be blood if it, if they're critically ill. Um, and that would be a St. Stegen's Blakemore tube if they're varicial bleeds. And that would be antibiotics if it's a varicial bleed. Or that would be a scope if it's a, um, uh, like both if it's a varicial bleed or an ulcer. So that's kind of like, and then Nexium and transamic acid and a um, <laughs> a tube in, through the nose and so on. That comes in second or third. But if I use like opportunity cost, is this concept that if I use the time all the time at giving training the asset, maybe the surgeon will say, oh, but you might as well give it. It's not dangerous. Well, no, it's not dangerous. But I'm using time that I could be using on something else. And that's, that's the opportunity cost. It's dangerous because I'm not giving blood when I'm giving transamic acid. It's dangerous because I'm not uh, resuscitating the patient. Uh, we, we're using the only line that they have on that. And so, so that's what that's what the concept of opportunity cost is. Then I'll give it if they want it. Uh, I know the evidence is really, really like there's good evidence that it's not good, <laughs> uh, it's, or, or it's neutral to give. It doesn't help. So, so that that's kind of what we need to know in in, in different conditions. And I just showed you my illness scripts and ulcers when it comes to treatments, right? Then prognosis is also good to know. Um, and it's, that's, that's all about the end of life discussion or what we talk to, to the patient, how long would it last, if, if we're sending them home and so on. That's important uh, as well. And then, of course, from all of this, we'll do our S-bar. Um, and that's where I mean, like we, we can we can kind of hear where, you, where your S-bar is coming from and what kind of time critical conditions you've been considering. Now, before moving on, try to, try to think of the time critical conditions at time zero with, let's say, Mm, let's say dyspnea, because that's what we're going to talk about later. Okay, uh, one more concept here uh, before going into the probabilistics. Um, so our illness scripts, just like we just talked about, like with ulcer or with uh, ACS, develops over time. When we come fresh out of medical school, then our illness script consists mostly of book knowledge. We haven't seen any patients, we don't have any experience to like see how it actually presents. We don't know how to gather the information. We don't know anything like, or we do know, may even know something, but not that much compared to someone who has been out and working for a long time. With time, our illness scripts mature. We Kind of not. We kind of know that they don't necessarily like the ACSs don't necessarily present typically with chest pain all the time. You can have someone who presents atypically, and that's not that uncommon. Actually, it's like ten or twenty percent, I think. Especially female, especially in certain subgroups, it much it's much more. Um, so in female uh, neurological deficit patients, diabetic patients, and elderly, that combination or just one of those features will make it more likely that they have an atypical presentation, just like, like, like dyspnea or mm, fatigue, influenza-like symptoms, or dizziness, and so on. Right. So, um, so some uh, when we once we get uh, become more expert, we will be better at picking up these things and knowing when conditions actually present atypically. And to actually not, and to not miss them, and um, we have different expertise in different illness scripts. We don't like depending on where we work and what we see. So even though uh, even though someone is an expert in one thing or in one area because they worked a lot with orthopedics, they may they may not know the pediatrics about it. Uh, so so it depends. And when patients, this is a there's a great book called How Doctors Think by Catherine Montgomery. And it's all about uncertainty and the irreducible uncertainty in, in, in medicine in general and, 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 and a lot of other things. I highly recommend that book. 
It's really good. And so when we have, a, if, let's say this is what we know about a condition, either as an expert or, or a novice, and the patient presents like this. Well, there's enough overlap with our knowledge, both as, as an expert and, and as a, um, a novice, that we will pick this up. This may be the chest pain, pa chest pain patient who has a crushing chest pain that came on, uh, like started uh, from zero and came up to maybe eight or nine th uh, through the time span of seven, eight minutes. They were walking and when they sit, sat down, it didn't go away. Now, they sweat, now they're sweating and maybe a bit nauseous and kind of had that sense of doom uh, on them and the, their ECG is ischemic. That's a presentation that is like what you call a slam dunk. You always have to think of the other conditions still. Could be something else. We need to rule it in and need to consider that there might be something in the background as well because it's probabilistic, right? It might be an 80% chance of this being a um, ACS um, um, or, or and even a OMI, like an occlusion, myocardial infarction, as we would like to say. It might be an 80% chance. But what does the, uh, the 20 other percent consist, consist of? Like, are there any uh, more dangerous things hiding there? Uh, is it opportunity cost to actually even think about it? Or should I actually consider it? Depends on what kind of patient it is and so on. But anyway, no matter what, what kind of patient you have, the patient is always coming from their own situation. They, they have to have to explain the symptoms to you. There are always some kind of uncertainty in this, loss in translation. Or they may present with just some oddball presentation sometimes. Some of it is not within what we would call ACS, right? It may be, oh, but they also uh, had this um, weakness in their arm. Well, usually they don't have weakness in their arm. They have tinkling or they have some kind of, but they don't have weakness in their arm. Hmm. All right. And, and depending on how big that area is, there, that's Montgomery's point. Like, no matter, like, we have our illness scripts and the patient will always present with some kind of, overlap that is like something that is not overlapping with what would we think either because of the way they explain it or like, there might be an oddball finding because people are different every people like medicine is like in, according to Catherine Montgomery it's not a science it's a science of the individual and 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 science uh, science of individual cannot happen that's why Catherine Montgomery says that we are we the way we practice is more what we call practical um, practical uh, knowledge called phronesis, and we do what we call abduction instead of deduction. We we go to the specific patient, get to gather the data, and then we go into our own like uh, like archive of illness scripts to see whether that their symptom matches. That's what we're doing here. Does it match? And we go back to the patient and see um, whether it actually works, what we're doing to them. And if it doesn't work, then we have to reconsider. It's like an iterative process, right? That's what that's the magic of, or, or not, not not magic. That's the phronesis, as Catherine Montgomery would say, of of medicine and emergency medicine, right? But my point here is, if you have a patient that is um, presenting really like not with a lot of overlap, the novice would not pick this up. This may be someone with influenza-like symptoms, old female with influenza-like symptoms, and the and the and the expert knows. Oh, well. There is this overlap with ACS, uh, with influenza-like symptoms and older females with diabetes, right? There is this overlap, but the novice may not pick that up because they would think, ah, oh, ACS is only um, chest pain. So, yeah, so take homes here. <laughs> There's always, like, as you mature your illness scripts as you grow, um, it's okay to ask experts in the beginning of your career and also further on. Um, and and um, even though you're an expert, sometimes the overlap is really, really minor, but it's big enough that you're over a threshold to actually work it up. But you, there will always be a irreducible uncertainty. Like all this area, it's uncertain. Do this patient actually want to be worked up? Do we actually, um, we, we can go into shared decision making with this patient. Like, do we want to work in the emergency department for the one in a, maybe one in 10, one in, 20 maybe one in a hundred reason uh, or, or likelihood that, that 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 this could be an acs do you is that important enough for you and if you're in uh, may, sometimes it is sometimes it isn't right that's what we can that's what we're working with probabilistically 
And that's the inherent irreducible uncertainty of all medicine, but especially also in emergency medicine, because everything is more uncertain in the beginning of a presentation of symptoms. All right, so just to state that patients don't have disease, only probabilities of diseases. The probability is pushed up and down by our tests. The test is less important at the starting point. Oh, sorry, the test itself is less important than the starting point. That's a new one, and I'll go into that. And always think about a test when we, whether or not it's positive or, sorry, think about a test, how it will affect your decision, and if it's positive or negative. Um, if it doesn't change our decision, then we shouldn't do it, all right? And it's really important when we see patients in the emergency department, um, taking the D-dimer, for instance, um, does it change my decision? If not, then I should not do it. If I don't have, if I, if I don't consider, if I don't think DVT or pulmonary embolism is on the map, I shouldn't do that test, right? Because if it's positive, well, then it's positive and it doesn't change anything, as we'll see. And if it's negative, well, I already don't think it's pulmonary embolism, so I shouldn't do that test, right? And I should tell the patient, also, if, if not, maybe not with the D-dimer, but with other tests, we should tell the patient um, what, like, oh, I'm... What, every time we're thinking about doing a test, uh, like one of the bigger tests, at least, at least, like doing a CT scan. Okay, if this CT scan comes back, then I'll do this. If this CT scan comes back positive, then I'll do this. And negative, I'll do this. And also when we like give the plan to the next next guy or girl that that is um, taking care of the patient, then like then if you have that kind of plan, then you, then that's excellent. That's what we want. That's what we want. Like fly ahead of the plane, as we say. Um, okay, so let's go into a bit of math or a bit of more concepts about probabilistic thinking. Um, so if we think about maybe ACS, there's a, uh, and the patient with chest pain, let's say that, and then there's a 0% chance of them having chest pain down here, or ACS down here, and there's a 100% ch chance of them having um, uh, ACS up here. Then we start somewhere on the line, and where we start is called a pretest probability. So we may start um, for specifically ACS. We know from studies of prevalence, in the emergency department that around maybe 10% of all patients, like all comers with chest pain, before knowing anything about the patient, will have an a acute coronary um, syndrome. So we start at 10%, right? And then we begin doing a lot of tests. And we may think of tests as being these like blood samples and, and maybe CT scans or POCUS or clinical examination findings, but tests are much more than that. These tests that move us up and down, sometimes they're quantifiable, sometimes they're not. The ones that are quantifiable are the ones that we've done studies on, right? Like D-dimer or CT scans and so on. And they're not that good either, almost always the studies, because as we talked about, are they done in the emergency department? How much can I rely on that? What is the insurated reliability of the test? Because if I do this test, especially if like it's a really hard test to do, to perform like, I don't know, can you see, can you hear the, the third heart sound gallop, which is a really good test if you can hear it in the emergency department with a stethoscope. Um, I can't, I certainly can't so, because it requires some kind of expertise and setting that I don't have, even though it's a good test. So it all, also depends on how can I do that test? And we talk a lot about that in emergency medicine because a lot of the tests that we do have been studied in different settings than our department and in our setting. Um, Hints test is one of the examples, like in dizziness. And there's a lot of discussion of whether we can do it or not. And we do believe, as I've talked about in different video videos, we do believe we can. We just need to the practice, right? And um, but we, we start with this pretest probability of 10% with this patient, and then through our tests, formal or non-formal, or quantifiable or non-quantifiable, um, non, then, then we get to some, somewhere, like we start off like just by looking at the patient, that, that makes our pretest probability go up and down as well. And we don't have to like quantify it, or we don't have to like think of it analy analytically like this all the time. But we can, but it can be healthy to know what kind of things going on behind the scenes, and then at some point we can pull out this graph and then say, "Oh, we are kind of here." Um, okay, so we um, 
we get the history of the patient. We see the patient, uh, how they look. Oh, they're they're, they're crushing. They're like they, they look like with a sense of doom. They're sweating. Oh, then our precess of blood goes up, and then they say, "Oh, the chest pain is is, is like like it's like crushing, and they have like it, it radiates to the arm." Then then it goes up, right? So, and how much it goes up with it depends on each of these tests, like each of these like questions that we ask, what the likelihood ratio is, whether it's pleuritic or not pleuritic, whether, uh, whether and, and if you do an ECG, whether there's ST elevation or not ST elevation. So all our tests, questions, what we see, and so on, formal or unformal, have attached to them a known or unknown likelihood ratio. And that likelihood ratio goes up or goes down. It makes the condition less likely or more likely or neutral. So for ACS, a um, if I see them in crushing chest pain, if they say that they like all of the things like in the illness script of chest, uh, acute chest pain, uh, sorry of, of of ACS, if I see if I hear any of those things by them telling me the story and I'm not pulling it, pulling that information out of them like by asking specific questions but especially if they're just telling me and there's i, I can see them having these, these these symptoms then my likelihood ratio goes way up for, for that it doesn't go up to 100 percent goes up here maybe and and uh, on the other hand if if, if if they say like oh it, it's at one point and, and when i'm moving it hurts and so on then it goes down and if you want to know I, i'll i'll come with home page uh, home page where you can see like the likelihood ratios and what kind of st like the, the studies on these things, but in general, it's more important to like kind of know the ballpark, know that for instance for ACS you cannot rule it out by just doing the history. Um, you usually have to have some, something more than that, ECG or blood samples. Okay, the tests that we do can be either one-sided, or they can be two-sided. A one-sided test may, like the most most known, is D-dimer, because if it's if a D-dimer is positive, it's very, very, very. It, it only increases your risk very, very little, like right? just by one percent from the uh, gut go, and maybe it, g it goes way down. Um, uh, it goes way down depending on your uh, if if it's negative, right? If it's done within the right framework, right, it has to be like all tests have some kind of in, in indication and in, like implication in, from the studies that they were done in, right? Um, so you need to have some kind of um, for D dimer. It, it's usually uh, said that within seven, seven days of your symptoms, then it's all right. Um, for a CT scan of the head for thunderclap headache, it's within six hours, and then it goes down the sensitivity. So the test is time dependent, oftentimes, right? Um, and also, um, yeah, this, so the test is, is time dependent. Sometimes, sometimes you have tests that are two sided. So if it's negative, then it's really not like then it's that it's quite unlikely, and if it's positive, then it's quite likely. That's usually a CC scan, and it, the, the, these these tests are usually quite expensive, either for the economy or for the patient by radiation. Okay. And then we have test thresholds, right? Um, and that's another concept that I wanted to introduce here uh, with this uh, Kashira's threshold model. So we talk about that we gather some kind of information for the, from the patient. We gather information. We, we may be starting here, 10% pre-test probability of an ACS in this chest, chest pain patient. And then we get some information that goes up maybe, and then it goes down. We get the ECG. And at some point, we are either on this side or that side of the test threshold. Now, if we're on this side of the test threshold on, on the lower side, then we would consider, quote unquote, the condition ruled out. Then it's not worth considering uh, any more tests. Um, and, and that's kind of a, um, um, we don't know when we actually are, have ruled that out. There's this con concept called the acceptable miss rate. Like how many ACSs do you want to miss? Well, I don't want to miss anyone, any ACSs, but probabilistically speaking, this is, that is impossible. The conditions never become zero, then you can never become 100, right? Um, so I will evidently, I, I will miss some, like 
and the uh, and and the the more I push this down, the less I will miss. But at some point, when we are below the test threshold, it becomes more dangerous for the patient to work them up, right? It becomes more dangerous to work them up. And the only studies we have on this, or the big good studies done on this, that's for pulmonary embolism, where they say like below maybe one point, I think it's usually below two, some say says below 1.4, something like that. There's uh, The point is there's a certain threshold below which pulmonary embolism is not worth being worked up anymore for the patient. So once you've done your D-dimer and it's negative in this patient that, turned, that had a low pre-test probability to begin with, then they, they shouldn't be worked up anymore. And then, oh, I, I want I want to do a CT scan. That, that's what I wanted. That my, that's what my primary care physician said I should do. Well, then we have to inform them. Uh, like, then, then that, that, that's a different discussion how to inform about that and, and how to engage in a compassionate care discussion with them about that and the shared decision making. But in general, I would say we should actually probably be quite personalist, personalistic here about this, saying like that we are below a test threshold, and the reason why I'm having this conversation with you right now, the easy thing for me is just to just do the test, but um, but because I, I'm not hurt by it, by it, but you will be, you're at risk of being hurt by both by radiation and so on. And then it's a matter of philosophy um, and ethics whether it should be up to the patient to do the scan anyway, or it should be up to us to make sure that the, like, because the patient, this, these are hard concepts to understand for patients and we don't want to do unnecessary tests for, at, at a public or, or, or economic level either. So it depends. Um, and that's a different discussion, but we are, when we're below the test threshold, it's not, we, we don't want to work up the patient anymore because it's not worth it. One of my questions that I have unanswered uh, is is then whether whether this um, how much information do you have to have to consider the workup good enough for you to say that oh I'm I'm comfortably below the threat test threshold uh, I cannot get any more like even if I got more information I would not um, uh, I would not get over the test threshold with with a high likelihood ratio right. Um, and especially when you're in triage, sometimes you send home patients. And you say, ah, did I really get enough information to do that to make that decision? And that's that's constantly something that we think about in emergency medicine, where, whether or not we have gathered gather enough information. And usually, if it's a young person, and if it's not if not if it's not an atypical question, then it's usually oh well, I, I did get enough information. That's all right. But sometimes we're we're in doubt whether or not where we are. So that's that's that concept, and that's why that's important. Um. And then you have the other end. That's the treatment the treatment threshold, and the treatment threshold is um, well above which um, you don't have to do any more tests because the pa the patient <laughs> is it's more beneficial for the patient just to be treated than to be tested anymore. And then you have this land in between here, which uh, Casey Parker, uh, one of the broom ducks, uh, the broom duck podcaster and blogger, uh, an emergency physician and all around great guy, uh, <laughs> he um, Seemingly great guy, great, great guy. I haven't met him. Um, he um, he talks about this land of shared decision making. This is where we are. Oh, do we want to do a more tests, or or are we comfortable with being where we are and, and not working you up anymore? It depends on the patient, right? And sometimes if we are up here, then and it's a dangerous condition. Yes, then we want to do it. And but if we're way down here, then probably sometimes, oh, it takes six hours for you to wait to get this work up, to get this lumbar puncture, to get your um, your risk all the way down. And then sometimes they don't want to. And then it's an informed decision, right? Okay. Um, what moves the test threshold and the treatment thresholds up and down are uh, these, like in the nutshell, these three things. How bad is the disease? How bad or good is the test? And how bad or good is the treatment. So if we have a disease that is really bad, like aortic dissection, we have a really good test for it, uh, which is CT scan, and we have a really good treatment if it's caught early, then like which is surgery, then we'll want to have a really low test threshold for it, even though that is quite unlikely. And that means that we have to <laughs> be doing a lot of CT scans uh, because testing for something that is unlikely to hurt in the beginning, like with the breast cancer um, uh, screening test, um, then 
then then it, testing for something that is really low risk to begin with um, means that even with a great test like a CT scan, you will have to do a lot of scans, right? And some ethics ethical um, thinkers in emergency medicine think about well. Is it even necessary to do these scans? Why is it better from a public perspective to actually just well, we'll just miss those conditions because we are doing so many scans for just finding that like, or at least we have to think that the threshold has to be pushed a bit up because there's so many scans being done. Like if your hit rate is one in a hundred or one in a thousand for a, for an aortic dissection, think about that all that hay being burned, right? That's not fair to all the other patients either. Well, that, that, that's a discussion, but that, that, that's that's where we where we are. That's some of the more like philosophical things that we discuss in emergency medicine about these things. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, if we have a really benign disease or condition, um, if we have a really bad test, like uh, like or we have a really benign disease, like Tietze's syndrome or or musculoskeletal pain. Um, and we might have a really good, oh, sorry, really the bad test, like pushing on the chest to see if if, if there's if it's there or not. And we'd have a really like quite a not a non-specific treatment. Then then like like NSAIDs is quite good, but like we don't maybe maybe don't have a good treatment either. Then the test threshold go way up, right? Way way up. And emer and in an emergency medicine, we we usually want to say that to the patient, like they want to know what is wrong oftentimes, and we want to know the time critical condition that we have to rule out. We don't. We we we're not finding out what the specific reason is for the condition. That is something that sometimes is found out by the workup for the time critical condition. So it might be a byproduct of the workup, but it, we're not going to find out what that. That's not our purpose today to find out what the cause is of your symptoms. That's really important, like in an expectation management way, to talk with the patient about. Here are some of the home pages where you can find these likelihood ratios. Um, and just to, like, I'll show you in the next page the more precise um, Fagan's normogram. But in general, uh, you have what you call a tennis rule. A likelihood ratio of zero, oh, sorry, of one, uh, usually is like, uh, it doesn't do anything. Uh, it doesn't point you uh, up or down in probability of the disease. Two is maybe like the tennis rules because like you have 15, like in tennis you have the point score system is 15, 30, 40, and then it's a game. Um, so it's like two or five is like maybe five or 10% uh, increase and it's like 30% or 40% increase up here. So that's, that's why it's important to, um, and it's not quite precise but it, because it depends on the pretest probability, but it's, precise enough so if you're beginning from zero and you get the, that that one then you're you won't like um you won't go up all that way up but so i guess the example is if you have from a sensitivity if you have the test that was 99 percent sensitive and 99 percent specific that would usually have a like ratio of maybe I don't know, 20, uh, like, sorry, uh, more, more like 40 or maybe even 100. Really, really good test. But if you're coming from like in this graph, then you will probably see, look like you'll, you'll be going all the way up to 100%. And then you you wouldn't do that. Um, you would you would be only like going a little bit up. So in the, in the extremes here, you, you will not see, like, these are not useful like concepts. That's why we will do the, what you call the Fagan's normogram next because that's a more precise way of saying it. But in general, like if you like you can do as a rule of thumb, that is the tennis rule, like around 10%, maybe 15%, then 30, 40% up here increase from maybe if you have your 10% and then you have your 40, then, then, you, then you get a test that is positive, which have the likelihood ratio of 10, then you will get up to a 40, 50. That's good, like as a pragmatic way of seeing it, seeing it. But if you want the precise version, yeah, I'll, I'll show you that now. Um, and yeah, and, and from in this concept, then like, it's important to say that if you have a really low precess probability to begin with, then if you have a positive test, you can never move more than, move than more than one or two boxes here. And uh, so that's with the low precess probability, so that's your chest, or sorry, that's your, um, 
mammography workup uh, of the population in the low risk population then you will just that being positive that will just give you maybe up here still below the assess threshold maybe or maybe up here depending on what your ethics are on screening but um in the same way if you have maybe a patient who has a classical inlet script uh presentation of aortic dissection then when you do a d-dimer then that's a really good test it has some, maybe a negative likelihood ratio of um, minus 0 0.1 or even below below that like sensitivity of, uh, of maybe 98 then it goes down one and two, but not all the way down. You still have a, uh, and the same with, with D-dimer and pulmonary embolism. It goes all the way, it goes down, but never more than, than two. I'll show you the, I'll show you the Fagans normal RAM, which, which makes it maybe a bit more, um, I, I usually think concept wise, these things become easier in that way. So we have our tests here. And we take the example of a D-dimer. Oh, from this study, the D-dimer is in aortic dissection is like this. And then we do our test. And and if we have a le really low precess probability to begin with, sorry, the Fagans norm program is like this: precess probability here, post test probability over here, and then you'd like kind of draw a line through the likelihood ratio that your test is. So in here it's 0 0.05 and minus, and then here is minus 0 0.05, and you go way right down here. So from a low precess, coming from a really low precess probability, you kind of using it, you using it as a screening tool, and then you you just you end off with with a with a low um, low precess probability as well, uh, post test probability. That's not what you know, that's obvious. If you did the positive test, like they would, this would be like screening it screening with a D dimer, both for pulmonary embolism but also for an aortic dissection. Then you'll have to draw through number number three, two here. That would be maybe oh you end up around two anyway, right? Maybe maybe a bit higher, but it's it's really not that much. So it doesn't really change like maybe from two to three percent doesn't really change anything. And here a concept becomes obvious another concept comes becomes obvious that i hope you're seeing um it took me a while to <laughs> figure it out but so tests are not important tests depends on the pretest probability it's the context that important is the pretest probability that is, that is important because the test is still the same the test characteristics is almost always the same depending on whether you have a severe condition or or a non-severe condition the test the test accuracy is the same and that's that's also another pit uh, a, bold, uh, like a, a pit hole to fall into whether that is true or not and i know some studies that says it's not quite true but in general let's like as a rule of thumb you can assume that the test is is the same depending on how high the risk of the condition is um so so if so so here, here we can see here's the, here's the high likelihood ratio like maybe 60 percent risk then you go down and you go down those two boxes or in this Fagans norm and you go down to maybe 5%. And even if you have a 90, then you'll go down to 20%. And that's not an acceptable miss rate for a aortic dissection, most people would think. Right? The acceptable miss rate for aortic dissection might be lying down below 2% is a good rule of thumb for most things. But probably even below that. All right. For our dissection, our precess probability to begin with before seeing the patient is just general population is one in a hundred thousand. In the emergency department, it's definitely more than that. I've seen several, <laughs> and it's not like I I, I haven't seen a hundred thousand patients. So so it's definitely higher than that in the emergency department. But that's where we start, and then we if we can get that data on the precess probability in the emergency department, then we'll get that, and we'll do a clinical guesstimation from all illness scripts. And we kind of get up to well, if, if the sudden like aortic is the is the um, is the thunderclap headache of the chest. So if we do get uh, chest pain that is cr uh, like coming like that, coming on like coming on, comes on really suddenly, and the patient says that freely without forcing it uh, uh, out of them, and it's like NRS of ten from the beginning, and maybe maybe even with additional features like neurological deficits or radiating to the back or it's like tearing and it's is moving then then we get a really high precess probability right and then the d-dimer would not be enough 
last thing about the, all of this math and concepts of probabilistic thinking or Bayesian thinking that we use in emergency medicine, we don't carry calculators. Like in certain North American uh, systems, they will think of this think of this as really like percent per, percent wise. And I don't think I don't think the data is mature enough for that. I don't think it's precise enough for that. But I think the concepts are really really important. So we shouldn't be thinking of this like all the time with old patients. But it's this this is the concept that if we're discussing a test, whether we're below or above a, threat, a certain test threshold, whether we are doing um, like whether we, whether we should be doing this test, does it really change anything? So this is what these are the concepts that we're talking about, and that's why I wanted to to show this to you. Um, but we don't take our calculator out and and and, and think like, that that's not him. that's I don't think that I think the data the data is way too uncertain um, about likelihood ratios, about our guesstimation, our estimation or guesstimation of precess probability is is too um is <laughs> I mean, it's, it's too uncertain. Yeah, acceptable miss rate, we've already been through that. Just wanted to show you some of these likelihood ratios for a specific symptom, like for chest pain, radiation to both, like this is for chest pain um, and likelihood ratio of, of uh, ACS. So likelihood ratio of ACS, if you have radiation to both arms, is 2.6. Then I would, if we just take radiation to both arms, if I... If it's a symptom that is really, really common in the common culture, like you see it in all shows, on TV shows, you see it everywhere, and you see it on on billboards, then then the likelihood ratio kind of gets diluted, because then everyone thinks when they have chest pain, then like we know from like from studies on functional disease and how we um, um, somaticize, as we call it, like we we think the normal feelings that we have in our body from day to day become some kind of disease oriented like we, we look through it from a disease orientation uh, in our mind's eye if we do that and we we are prone like or we are we, we know from tv that oh if you have chest pain and usually you have something in your in the arms then then suddenly you, you once you do get chest pain then you can get, get into this like evil spiral of somatization which everyone is prone to but especially those with anxiety disorders but but the, all of us do it, yeah? And if you want to know about, more about that, then check out Susan O'Sullivan's book on It's All in Your Head about these um, like really interesting conditions that I've also done a lecture on uh, <laughs> in neurology, uh, the neurology lectures on this. Um, but in general, so, so, so I always... I like to know about the quality of the data. How did you? How was this presented to us? How was this? These questions asked. Did you sit down with your patient? Did you ask a broad question? Um, did they? Uh, did they give this information uh, out freely? And is it something that is commonly common knowledge that this is a like this is a symptom of this condition? If it's not common knowledge, and if they gave it away freely, then I have a then I have a certainty that this is a high likelihood ratio thing. If you if you ask specifically oh did did the chest pain did, did it also radiate then i don't give as much value to the likelihood ratio does that make sense then then then, then i then i think maybe it's at the lower border of this and if it's if you gave it away freely then then it's then it's the higher border so the quality of the way we take the history is really really important in emergency medicine that's why we do actually have to sit down in emergency medicine we do have to let the patient speak and tell their story and we because otherwise we will just be be taking much much more of their time and our time so it's it way it, it, i usually talk about it like bobsleighing it's really important that you do your thing good in the beginning because all of the seconds invested in the beginning is spared like many folds in the in the end just like bobsleighing when you <laughs> all right and don't be discouraged just because all of these like symptoms have a low precess probability, a low likelihood ratio. None of these by themselves rule out anything, but they do create a pattern for us. And we do kind of know whether this is an ACS more likely or whether this is more likely a pulmonary embolism and so on. So we do kind of know something from these and we, we don't rule out this just by knowing oh there was there was no change over the the, the this time then then that doesn't rule out in or rule out 
that's not how we should use it. We should, but we should kind of know also that the bits of history that we're using here are quite um, are quite weak, and that's usually that's that's usually the case in chest pain that we actually have to need we need to know that, and we need to have an ECG uh, at least, and oftentimes a troponin to actually because these are tests that are quite much better. But that doesn't mean that they're useless. These are really good at assessing the presupposable probability before doing it, and actually because we don't only think about chest pain uh, in we don't only think don't only think about ACS we also think about the other conditions right and that's kind of the soup of the patient's story that we're trying to discern like distinguish between to see whether are we working up ACS and pulmonary embolism or are we working up other things as well right or is it only ACS here okay and this is also what we talk about. Um, so, just this is one of my pet peeves. That's why I keep coming back to it. But gathering information with the patient is really, really important. Also in emergency medicine, and so the, the, I guess you can check out like, is the house on fire? Like, is there a high signal? Is this really, really, like, is this it? Uh, is it really clear that the patient has crushing chest pain? They they are vomiting. They they have an ECG with a STEMI on it. Then we don't have to go into these details usually with the history. Then it's kind of Tell me what happened, and then then they then usually we don't have to. Then we can ask more specific questions. We have to be careful sometimes because we may do premature closure, even though. But usually, it's opportunity cost to to like get too much information on these patients. Then you'll just like go. We have to do this. Um, but that's if the house is on fire, or if they're in the bad way, then that that's usually not the case. Most most patients in the emergency department you can sit down and talk to. So then you do that. Sit down, sip, sip it. Like don't disrupt, don't just don't, dis don't disrupt the patient within a couple of minutes. They usually stop within two to four minutes, and it's really important that they get to tell their story. And you have to actively listen. Lean in, listen actively, maintain maintain uh, appropriate eye contact and touch if you need to. Um, I like to touch the patients, but not all all people do, and I, and you have to do it when it's appropriate in the, in the conversation and so on. We all have our own like ways of doing compassionate care and active listening, but um, validate their statements. Uh, yeah, like um, after they tell the told their story, uh, talk about expectation management. Like today, we're going to do like rule out time critical conditions. We're not. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I need. I, I can find out what the specific cause is. Always, that's not the purpose. And so on and so forth. Like, and, and can I help you with anything else? Uh, like, I, I'll try to do a plan and then do a follow up for you. Um, and uh, there will be a wait time uh, for this amount of hours. But we don't forget you and so on. Do some uh, expectation management is really really important. Then validate what they're saying. If one of your friends suddenly said, "Oh, I have I, I have this crushing headache and I have a terrible time the last like like week." And I haven't gone outside, and I, I I can't eat, I can't drink. Then then the next statement you 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 do after they they've told you that wouldn't be, oh, but how uh, um, how is it is it is it coming and going or um, how's it with your stomach? Uh, <laughs> you'll say you'll do a validating statement, which is is like that sounds horrible. Um, good that, good that you came in. Um, really good that you came in because most people are embarrassed of coming into the emergency department most people don't want to go there almost uh, like like uh, uh, don't don't uh, it's, it's the system that is kind of funneling them to the emergency department it's not them who wants to go there and it's really important that distinction so and and, and i often also as a validating statement say to, to right off the bat i apologize for the wait time i'm sorry that you had to wait for this long um, um, because that validates their wait. Like I know that they, 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 they they've been waiting, and it's horrible to wait for that long. So that's I think it's really important to actually. Uh, I personally like like think that's really important because that, that 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 kind of validates their suffering in that time, and I've 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 seen that they have. I, I know that they have suffered in that time because of the wait, because of their uncertainty and what has been going on, and we have several studies on on that from Rick Body. Um, and and papers on on the on compassion and empathy and the uh, problem of waiting and and waiting and not knowing with all this uncertainty about their condition and whether so on and so forth right and the uncomfortability on the of the emergency department so it's just nice to to say sorry to begin with if they've been waiting for a long time and see if they can may, be be made more comfortable before going into what the problem is and it's important to like from this 
soup of things that we do in the beginning to know what is the problem what is the problem why are they here today and that's what what i talk about like what is their like was the was the yearly control and it just happened to find something and that, that yearly control then it's a low priestess probability right or is it a um or or is it sort of like I I I that uh, they 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 couldn't manage it at home anymore because it's so, the pain is so severe that's a different thing right so so it depends how they how they, their way in is really important and what is the problem what is and if you want to know more about that check out stimulus podcasts by Rob Orman he has a really great talk about like how antibiotics uh, like oh they just want to they just want antibiotics well why did they come in why do they want the antibiotics uh, antibiotics well it's because they have a like they they thought that it helped with this condition oh well then then i don't want to prescribe that but then and then i'd rather want to talk with you um about what to expect and uh, so that the first step what is the problem is really important and when we and it's not always that we as, as i talked about we don't always get to the problem in the beginning. Like sometimes we have to get kind of far ahead into the disease process or the disease talk before we kind of know what the problem is. Sometimes we have to move on um, while still leaving this thing open. But most times we can find out what the problem is and what is the reason for them coming in here today. Yeah. If we do this good, then that this is our best diagnostic test in the emergency department. I will say that again. History is the best test in the emergency department and compassionate care. Um, some would say it's POCUS, but I think this is highly underrated and it's really, really important. And you save time by doing it. And I try to, when I move away from the patients, when I move, when, when I go away from the stall of the patient and I've, I've kind of talked with them and I examined them, then, then I kind of want to have a plan before moving on. Sometimes I can't um, uh, because I didn't finish or whatever. And, or, or, but, but, but I want to have a plan and I kind of know, okay, I'm doing this CT scan and if that's negative or that's positive, then I'll do this because then I can cognitive offload myself from that patient. I know what's going to happen with that patient. It just takes time to, to do all the things, right? Um once we've done this soup, then we'll, uh, as we did in the beginning of this lecture, talk about the time critical uh, differential diagnosis. We'll fill in the blanks of, of the don't miss form that I just showed you. And if you want to know more about why it's so important, this part, and why even the emergency physicians should take the time to sit down and talk with your patients, um, and I'm not the only one saying this, then they should check out this my compassionate care for emergency physicians lecture or this one the probabilistic thinking and headache uh, short version in english all right last thing about probabilistics i promise um but it's an important one up till now we talked about a condition as just one condition um like with a zero to 100 percent risk but actually every time we see a patient we have many differential diagnoses right and they um our tests make the probability of different ones go up and down so i I'll usually call this the landscape of differential diagnoses and so let's introduce the more like how it is in real life and again we don't have to think about this in this way real time but there are certain points in the conversation with the patient or in our diagnostic workup where we it's good to sit down. It's, it's called a forcing strategy. Force yourself to like, okay, sit down, stop. What is the three time critical conditions that we um, need to rule out now? Okay, it's this, this, and this. Have I have I ruled out already? No, okay, then I have to do this test. Easy. That's a forcing strategy. The hard part is getting out of your own mind to actually do it and getting into the habit of doing it. Because that's the best, probably, we don't have data on it. I think that's probably one of the best ways to not miss anything and be more like, like kind of uh, getting yourself a um, routine in um, these, like, I've uh, and, 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 uh, routine, routinely think about, think about these like time critical conditions. And because it's really easy just to think, oh, it's just pneumonia. I'll just send them home. I'll just both in your head and for the patient and for um for the um for the chart say that 
I've ruled out this, this, and this. I don't think it's this, this, and this because this, this, and this. Okay, then it's good. Then, then you're then you're solid. Um, and this is not a lecture on how to chart an emergency mechanism, but that's and and and, and, and how, whether we should do like certain statements to the patient, whether we should say, oh, this is not it, or whether we should like say, oh, you have a, maybe a, a, is a low risk of this or is a low risk of that. It depends the, what, what kind of patient you have. And my friend Andreas Scalabai has um, done a great uh, Lekker at Sienings article on, on this topic, whether we should be very um, firm with the patient and say, there's nothing wrong with you, go home, or whether we should say, ah, maybe, uh, like, you have a low risk of this, I don't, I think you're below the threshold for this, but I, but I would like to see you, you have, you have a, like, I, I would like to have a short, uh, come in again, if you, if you have any, any symptoms at all, it depends on our risk and the patient's risk, right, and our risk aversiveness and so on, that's another uh, story, all right, but, if we look at the chest pain patient before knowing anything about this 50-year-old chest pain patient, then we'll say the chest pain maybe has a precess probability for ACS of 10%, maybe a bit higher because he's 50-year-old. We did know something more about this guy this time. Um, and the dissection is very low, like 100,000 in the general population. We don't know how many in Sweden in the emergency departments, but something around between 0 and 1%. Then PE is maybe... Oh, two to five percent, so, so, and these are the time critical conditions from our our, our two by two ta table here. These are the ones here. Then we have the not time critical ones, and maybe some of the zebras over here in the other one that are unmeasurable. And you can see that these two columns, this one is maybe twenty five percent, and this one is maybe sixty. So that's before going in. The much more likely it's it's much more likely for this patient and every other patient in the emergency department before knowing anything about him that this is a benign condition, 85%, yeah. But we haven't had any information about them yet. And let's just take one bit of information about them. If we take that their pain is worse with inspiration, let's say that we got, gathered that data through um, them, uh, us sitting down with the patient and then they told us about it. Then um, different conditions become more or less likely. Like. Uh, the ACS becomes less likely because pain worse with inspiration doesn't doesn't fit with typical chest pain, right? It's not below the test threshold at all, and we have we have not gathered enough information to be below the threshold test threshold yet at all. But that's just um, part of it, right? It goes just from that data point, it goes down. Uh, the dissection goes down as well. PE goes up because that's that is con that is uh, this uh, like it is. Um, Something that could be PE with that kind of, or is more likely to be PE with that. Musculoskeletal also, because that also hurts with inspiration, and and other conditions may be going down, right? So, because the, because because everything else is going up, right? And then in this maybe there might if you subdivide this pneumonia and viral pneumonia and pleuritis may, might be this, but I don't care about that that much actually <laughs> because that's benign. Uh, maybe pneumonia if you have a CRP or 200, then that's a different thing. But but in general, um, the time critical conditions are the ones that I really uh, want to think about. Okay. So for for more from a more general perspective, we can always say that there's a column of time critical and likely conditions. There's not time critical and likely conditions as well, and then there's these not likely, so they're lower and time critical or not time critical conditions. So these four boxes can be be like this. And then we talk about like if, if it was BPPV, then oh, I found out that this this condition is much more likely. Then this one is being pushed down, right? Consider like assuming that uh, you have a hundred percent uh, condition, a hundred percent that that this is a closed system. There are no other conditions coming in. There 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 are no two reasons for those symptoms. Um, but if they're elderly and complex and critically ill, then sometimes they can have different conditions. It's like another, like uh, they, they they can have several reasons for one condition. Um, and an example is also in the critically ill, for instance, with shock. If you have someone who is in shock, then we all we are all told like, oh, there's there's the um, there's the uh, the shock that. Um, there's the um, what's it called? 
um, hypovolemic shock. There's the cardiogenic shock. There's the um, um, there's the um, obstructive shock, and there then there's the um, uh, uh, vasodilatory shock. Um, these are the four shock conditions, and you have dissociative shock as well. And we always think that is one of them, but usually in the critical ill patients, they usually have several of them at the same time. And that's so. So, so in, in in critically ill patients, we should at least with these syndromes like shock, we should also like we shouldn't be thinking totally like this. Oh, I found out that there's there's a tamponade. That doesn't mean that your trauma patient doesn't have a pneumothorax as well. So yeah. But in the stable patients, and especially if they're a bit younger, but also the even the older ones, we can quite reasonably think like this. Okay, so all of this information that I just gave you is something that I don't expect you to use or know how to use yet. It's something that when we do our course, uh, of which I'm an instructor, uh, emergency medicine core competences in, in Lund and in, in different countries, um, where we talk about probabilistic thinking for emergency physicians and non-technical skills and practice simulation and so on, we kind of ingrain this way of thought so that we learn through cases, because that's the only way to learn this, is through case, cases, cases, cases. It's through being in clinic and gathering the information yourself and being good at gathering the information in a compassionate way. It's, it's by, so it's, it's really like in, in practice that we learn this. So now, now you know kind of the theory. If you want to know something about, like if you want to be better at this, or if you, not that I'm again not that I'm that I'm an expert expert in this, but but if you want to become better at this, then um, when you're in the emergency department, um, ask us who are emergency physicians um, to to um, uh, to go through the case with you and 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 do the S bar and do all of these things, and then we can kind of we can more or less deliberately or more or less detailed. Uh, say like okay so you think it's this why is it what is your we can we might ask okay what is your precise probability of of this condition okay it's maybe 20 30 percent okay so you're not below a test threshold no you're not okay then we should do a test for it good okay so and let's say that test is negative what happens then if that test that's that's the forcing strategy if that's if, if that test is negative what then and if that test is positive, then what then? Okay, then we have a plan. Then we can already admit that patient now because we're waiting for that CT scan. If, if that, and if, if that is positive, then you're going to admit them. If there's negative, you're going to admit them anyway because so on and so on, right? So that's what we that's like what we call flying ahead of the plane. Um, and because we kind of get take to take it to the next step or next step and, or the first, second, or third step from where we are right now. Um, and we will use that in in the Lime room or the um, resource bay as well. So, 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 uh, and and we may also ask like, okay, you thought the precess purple is is thirty percent right now. Okay, what are the what does the last seventy percent consist of? That's another forcing strategy to kind of ask that question. Um, okay, so maybe we should. Uh, you think all of that is musculoskeletal, or, or are there maybe maybe five or ten percent that may be something more dangerous? Okay, because the patient's age is like that. Okay, that that does make the likelihood ratio go a little, little up, so on and so forth, right? And then we'll weigh the data points. And how did you actually take the history? Did you sit down with the patient, or did you ask like specifically? And why did you do that? Oh, he was really really in a bad way. Then you are allowed to do more specific questions to begin with, but in general, we want you to sit down with the patient and actually ask the broad question, because otherwise you will just go down a, a, a wrong path, oftentimes, so on and so forth. So that's why we do case-based learning in clinic, but the next best thing is to do cases with you guys in in real life, and I would love to do that um, in real life. I always love the discussions with these. Um, and it's different all the time. It's different every time because of the different variables that you bring uh, to the table. Uh, always a CC scan close by or is it far away. If you were in Africa, what you would you do? If you were in in northern Sweden, what would you do? And so on and so forth. So, what I want, I don't have the answers in these cases that we we do, and I I, I just facilitate them, so to speak. I facilitate that 
the discussion because uh, and, and kind of get you to think probabilistically about it and think more about it like an emergency physician would. Okay. Um, there is one area that in this lecture that I didn't go into, um, which is more like chest pain oriented and would be a great example of of probabilistic thinking and, and why we as emergency physicians think kind of differently when it comes to ACS than or not that differently, but we have a different terminology. Um, we're developing a, a new paradigm and a different terminology um, called OMI and, OM, uh, and NOMI instead of STEMI and non-STEMI. And if you want to know more about that, I don't think uh, because of time we want to do that here, but if you want to know more about that, then please check out my, my lectures on this. Um, and not that my lectures are the best on this. The best ones are from Dr. Smith, who is actually the uh, kind of the the person who's coined this term, OMI. And Dr. Smith's ECG block have these great um, uh, lectures on them where, where you can check that out and then and, and listen to him give the evidence behind it. But uh, I, if you want, if you want to ch check out my one as well, because it's uh, it's kind of um, going through a lot of the same things, but from a more Scandinavian perspective. Okay, let's go through some cases here, just just um, to, to, to hammer home some of these points that I that I've uh, made. So you see a 59-year-old woman who comes into the emergency department with a chest pain. And you get these in, this information from triage. Usually, when we do these cases, I'll, you, I'll uh, usually ask. You'll get some more information, like maybe an ECG on, a, on all chest pain patients. But you have to consider that maybe there are ten or twenty patients waiting for you to triage them right now. So you you cannot spend an insumable amount of time on this patient. Um, so you need to kind of decide what information is most important to get from this patient. Um, and how would you get that and and um, what kind of tests are most important and and then you have to decide whether should this patient go to the um to the um uh, critical care bay uh, like emergency bay uh line room um like a, and 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 draw a lot of resources should it go should you should you um Make it make it the next patient that some kind of um, doctor in, in in the emergency department sees. So you give like go to them and, and make them like you take this patient now and make them an orange patient. Or you said, oh well, this patient can actually wait hours in the emergency department's uh, waiting room. Uh, no worries. And maybe they have to be have had telemetry uh, while that while that's been going on or they have might have some kind of observation but most people there's again it's a zero-sum game you can't do that for all patients and all the all of the 10, 20 patients that you're going to see are you going to do it for this one or another one right and sometimes there's a lot of sick patients and then you have to be um <laughs> then you have to be kind of um um very um, creative with your resources and sometimes your resources are really scarce sometimes you're, you're you don't have doctors who have been practicing for a long time or they don't they, they cannot do a specific kind of patient or so on so it's really like doing being an emergency med, emergency physician especially in triage uh, has to do with being creative and has really has to do with this resource management and opportunity cost am i really spending my time the best by talking with this patient right now and cognitive deloading yourself like you do this. You do this, so that I can have and, and and I can I can make decisions on the important things, and don't be decision fatiguing yourself. Like don't don't make decisions that you don't have to make. Make someone else make those decisions because we know that the battery of decisions is running low after a while. It's tearing. We know that from studies that, and and if you ask Scott Weingart, he only makes decisions on the most important things, right? Because so he saves his energy. From the, from the minor stuff uh, that's the skill to hone because we want to be helpful but we know that we do not we don't have battery enough for the entire shift if we want to be helpful all the time with everything okay just some triage things from emergency medicine perspective um okay so this patient they, they don't look too sick on the but 59 year old with chest pain is always something and they have a bit, a bit low high heart frequency but otherwise it looks okay Wondering whether like we, we need just more some more information. We do what we call a Mabel's medicine allergies previously, 
uh, leisure like social and ethanol uh, and all the drugs and then smoking and Mabel's doesn't have like hereditary conditions which may be relevant it doesn't have exposure like um, travel exposure or vaccine status or in pregnancy pregnancy whether they're pregnant or not and so on so, so but this is just like like a, you can always add something i'll call it mabel's plus um it depends on but for most patients this is enough and oftentimes like the map is enough for older patients, the L is important. <laughs> Can they walk? What, is their, what, what are their activities of daily living and so on? But let's start in the... A wise man said, like, show me your medical uh, like list of medications and I'll show you what conditions you have. So there's always have to be a, a match between these two, right? So you have a heart, uh, heart uh, an ACS, right, with a PCI. Um, and, and for that workup, they found an aortic dissection type B. Uh, this is a something not an, an, an asymptomatic one. Here she has uh, atrial fibrillation, gastric bypass disease, oh, sorry, gastric bypass in 2016, COPD, depression, hypertonia, hypertonia and hypercholesterolemia. And she gets relevant medication for all of them. Um, and then she just she smokes a, a little bit and um, no, she's not allergic. Okay, so I'm, I'm not encouraging to do to go through these cases like this in real life, but right now for the sake of practice, we can we can uh, begin to like ask ourselves. We don't know. Let's let's assume that the problem is chest pain. We don't know that quite yet. We want actually to get this this like open open the question to the patient what is the problem and why did you come here today but as, as long as we, we can't do that through a case um, like we cannot practice that part of it that's why you have to practice in clinic and it's hard to do these things that's why it, it requires expertise and practice right uh, through your entire career but let's say that let's just assume that chest pain is the right answer here it, well, it is chest pain um, and we have our then we have our six dangerous conditions in our back of our mind uh, the six dangerous ones like what you ACS, uh, pyramidal cardiitis. You have pulmonary embolism. We have um, pneumothorax, and we have the upper GI thing, and we have um, the, the weird one, aortic dissection, right? So, does our like does our um, spidey sense go up or down on any of these conditions through this information? Well. We uh, we could say if you had had a cardiac infarction before, then then ACS goes up from this bit of information, right? Um, it would like say, uh, then then maybe go uh, then then maybe go. Uh, right now we're in 2016 in this case, so um, it may be going a little bit down from from this because it was normal, but this is not a really good test and and like. If you're presenting with chest pain again, that doesn't rule out it at all. But it goes a little bit down here, a lot up here. Um, dissection type B, was it symptomatic? Then it was even higher. But this is an asymptomatic screening. It is a like was it an aortic aneurysm? Then it, then it was a quite a high, low risk condition, right? Many people go around with like aortic aneurysm, and it depends on. The, then we need kind of need to know how big it was. Is it, was it an aneurysm of six centimeters of, or of 3.5 centimeters? That's a big difference, right? If you have a, one of six centimeters while you're only 50 years old or 59 years old, then that's kind of a high risk condition, even though it's a risk factor, high risk, high risk, risk factor. But, but if, uh, but if it was m m smaller, then it wouldn't be. But with dissection, I don't think we have much, much studies. I've never heard about a like. I don't come across a lot of patients with a type B dissection found by coincidence, right? So uh, I actually don't know what to do with this information. And oftentimes we don't. We don't know the likelihood ratio, but it's in our back of our mind. And if it's something we haven't heard about, then we're more likely to do the test usually. All right. So that goes up for aortic dissection a little bit. We don't know how much, but something. Then we have gastric bypass. Oh, sorry, we have atrial fibrillation. Well, hmm. It, it makes things like some some upper GI things like um, um, that might be mesenteric ischemia goes up. Um, 
it's but it and it will if they are treated with eliquis it makes the pulmonary embolism go way down right uh, if they're in, in, in they, it doesn't say the dose here if it's half dose of um, full dose but at least it goes down no matter what and if it was a full dose then it actually doesn't matter if if they're not if they're hemodynamically stable then it's the same treatment right um so so that that kind of kind of almost rules it out i think um Gastric bypass, mm, well, upper GI. We, we always have to think like if they're if they're non-tender in the stomach, then it's kind of yeah. But but and it's not really stomach pain they're presenting with here. But we always have to consider it upper GI, and it could be internal herniation. It can present atypically, and the problem is here that the CT scan will not rule it out. They have to be admitted, uh, or a surgeon has to say that it's not it. Um, yeah. And okay, we don't think that much about pneumonia, but here we may consider it because of the COPD. Um, it is something that we want to just consider. So we have several time critical conditions that has gone up, and some that like pulmonary embolism that has gone down by this. Um, and in general, don't to don't put too much weight on the on the uh, background information. Uh, Simon Carley has made a great lecture called. Um, do risk factors factor on Sankt Emlins and SMAC, uh, which can be um, viewed uh, freely. And um, and the, the concept here is there's too many risk factors that we don't ask about. All of us go around with different risk factors that we may that may or may not be relevant for what we're thinking about right now. But when we see the risk factors, we will see the patient in a different light. And we so we should and we will thereby premature closure sometimes or we would be more biased towards premature closure if we see that they have a oh they did have an or dissection it's really hard to not to do that ct scan now but if this history history pulls us towards a totally different thing like gastric bypass then maybe uh, it's just risk factors are not that important uh overall there are certain risk factors that are specifically important like this is maybe this may be a strange and and important risk factor but we see in the heart score there's only four like you have to have four like normal risk factors like diabetes and and the smoking and so on um, to actually get a, a one point right so so risk factors is something that should be take, taken with a grain of salt and they should always we should always see how are they discovered are they screened or have these, is it a screening test that's found them? Because then we can find every, everyone can have risk factors then. Or what? Uh, 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 or what's the symptomatic? And what is the? Um, how recent are they? How well controlled are they? And how? Um, how? Um, uh, how severe are they? Like, is it hypertension of 240 that hasn't been treated, and you have been going around with this for a long time, or is it? Uh, something else right is it, is it is it 145 and and you're on treatment then it's not hypertension that is really like that severe so it depends and and so so all of these factors weigh in when we're talking about these things all right then we go to the history which actually what's what was what, 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 what uh, is what we want so there was something about so we do the opqrst and it's also just to have a system this is like the maples and the opqrst for us emergency physicians is a kind of a system to know from the history that we've like that's it's a checklist because we all we often have to jump around from patient to patient and we kind of know okay have i asked about this have i asked about this and then that goes into the chart the opqrst when we're talking about like when, when we're charting and we're saying that Oh, the patient's pain was the onset was like this. The position was like this. The quality of the pain was like this. The radi the uh, relieving factors were like this. This the um, the um, uh, the severity was like this. The the, the temporal as aspect of it, it was like this. Um, because then you have the entire thing, and then it's then it can it's just like describing a wound. Uh, you want to know like the, the the borders, and you want to know like where it's placed, and and the description of where it's placed, and how big is it, and what kind of color it is, and what kind of consistency, and so on. Same with with history like this. And this go OBQRST doesn't have to be that. It can be Socrates is another one. Old car is another one like mnemonic for this. It doesn't have to just but having a checklist is something that goes through the like the blood of emergency physicians. It doesn't have to be a checklist checklist that you check off. But just that you have some kind of like the ABCs to go back to once you become like when when you come into a situation where you kind of don't know what to do, go back to that. 
All right, so she says her onset was she had three episodes of of uh, severe chest pain, NRS or VAS ten within the frame of tens uh, within, the, within the frame of seconds. Right, that sounds like a thunderclap of the chest. Right, has the, had had uh, she had the three times. That's kind of yeah, had three times, and uh, the localization was to begin with in the, in the central chest and then up towards the of the uh, up towards the um, jaw. With the first and the third episode, but the second episode was pain behind uh, the chest and then um, radiation towards bilateral arms. She describes it as like a kind of prickling pain, and 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 uh, uh, it's, it, there's nothing she can do to make it worse or better. She has an NRS of ten. Uh, the first uh, and third episodes uh, felt like like the jaw one. It felt like the pain that she had during her ACS. She doesn't have, and the plus here is like depending on the condition. So in certain conditions, um, chest pain, it's important to ask about dyspnea and, and and fever and so on. But in GI problems, it depends. Uh, it, 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 it's it's important to ask about vomiting or nausea and and bowel movements and and so on and so forth. So the plus depends on the condition. Okay, so we have a patient who has. Like severe chest pain in the central chest, sometimes with radiation to the jaw, sometimes with radiation to the arms. It's intermittent, and um, yeah, it's without any other features. And she thinks it sounds like the same as last time she had a uh, cardiac condition, at least two of the episodes, and the duration of the episodes like 20 minutes apart. Okay, so now we have kind of, okay. So at this point, what are we going to do? We are in triage. Uh, let's for, let's say we are in triage. We may also be a, uh, we may also just be on the night shift, and we just picked up this patient and and talked about talk with her. What are we going to do? So this is where we come into the emergency medicine mindset. So we may, there is a lot of things that we can do, opportunities to cost wise. But where are we on the spectrum? This is a good time to actually kind of look at the landscape of our uh, condition here. So right now we are at a high risk of of aortic dissection, right? Because these conditions, like the, the, the thunderclap headache of the chest, kind of like sudden and severe, is consistent with uh, aortic dissection. It makes it way higher, and we already had a, a somewhat high pre probability for that from the background. Um, it's still only like maybe 10% chance because it's a really, really low probability to begin with, but it's still like maybe five or ten percent chance, and that's too high. So we are going to do a CT scan right now. But are there other conditions that we may want to do as well? Are we we are going to the CT scan? Should we also just do the CT scan for the um, like the other things that goes against the order dissection differential diagnosis as well? Dissections, I guess, don't like don't classically come and go like this. It doesn't classically radiate to the arms, but it could maybe. And so, so there are some atypical features like these these when diagrams with Catherine Montgomery's book I, I, I showed you. Like there's some some uncertainty, but we're still above the threshold for this. Are there other conditions that we want to check out? Well, ACS of course because um, she had this episode before. Uh, it feels like before, and it's. And it is like chest pain, and this like usually it's not severe, but it's chest pain nonetheless, and it is with radiation, which is consistent with a with a classical chest, typical chest pain, All right? So so ACS and and aortic dissection and like pneumothorax, we'll get that from the scan we're doing anyway. Um, um, pulmonary embolism is not likely right now. Upper GI conditions, well. In this patient, we may say, what, what kind of blood samples are we going to do? Well, we are going to do maybe you. You're doing the you're going to do the CT scan of the stomach as well, and you may just want to ask internal herniation here as well, just to kind of reduce that risk. Because what if the scan of the aorta is negative? Then, well, that's what you have to think about. Are there any other tests that we want to do in this condition? Well, um, we want to. Uh, oh, uh, sorry about the blood, blood samples. We're also doing like a troponin. D dimer doesn't matter, right? <laughs> if D dimer for dissection is not important um, because it will not rule it out because we have too high of a pre test probability. We need to scan. And PE, and for PE, it doesn't matter because she's already on treatment. Um, 
so, uh, and and uh, and if we if you're taking uh, taking NOAC, it doesn't really it's probably not useful. It, there, no studies that I know of have been done on that, so it's probably not useful from a mechanis mechanistically um, standpoint. So, what are we going to do? Right now, we are on our way to the CC scan. We're saying to this, uh, we're, we're we're not going to. So. Uh, when I would do this case, a lot of people will say, oh, we have to examine the patient. Oh, we have to do the ECG. Oh, we have to do the blood samples right now and so on. And we wait. So you're not going to wait with this patient. This is not a patient that goes to the waiting room. We can Because we have the dissection as a differential, right? The only tests that we're doing now, these those are things that we were, like, we're already on our way to the CT scan. That's in our mind, right? From an emergency physician's perspective, we're already on our way to the CT scan. We want to be there now, so we are saying to the we're saying to our nurses, this is a priority patient. Do they uh, do the um, uh, do, put in a line? Actually, put in two lines. Um, are we going to do the POCUS? No, we're not going to do POCUS. We're going to do the CT scan anyway. So it doesn't matter whether we w w if we do the test and POCUS test and it is positive, then it doesn't matter. No, does, if it's negative, no, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, what kind of test could we do that could steer us away from the CT scan right now and actually go to somewhere else, which would be probably PCI lab, because that's the other thing we are considering ACS here, right? What would those, what would that be? And the, here we are, we have, we have if, we, if we consider the Venn diagram here, we have aortic dissection and we have ACS and they overlap. Um, we, we don't know, but do you have one, one of these distinguishing features in our illness scripts? that we can kind of use well there is this study and i'll show you the re the the the, the, uh, the uh, i'll show you uh, right here after this um the references that says that if we do find a typical STEMI, like or we would call an omi or we, we have ecg features um that are classical STEMI criteria then the risk of this being an aortic dissection will be reduced to a one in a two, one in two hundred chance of missing it. Now, are all studies perfect? No. Um, is this study perfect? Probably not. I haven't read it through all the way, uh, or or analyzed it in, in detail because we can't do that with everything. <laughs> um, have I? Um, do I have a C then other questions come to mind? Do I have a CT scan really close by? Yes, I do have them in my in my hospital. I will be going with the patient. I should, should get that CT scan right now. Do I have a PCI lab that are reluctant with this kind of history to actually do the PCI? Yes, I do have that. So <laughs> for me, the best thing for the patient would here be to actually no matter what this ECG shows, I will have to go to the scan in my hospital anyway. But so, 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 and, and every, everything, everything I do from here, from now on, and until I get to the scan, is waste of time for the patient. We can't do it on the way while we're waiting for the patient. To, but everything we're doing right now is opportunity cost, potentially for this very time critical condition for the patient. Right? That, that doesn't mean that it has to be done. We have, we do we do have to examine the patient because it has to be in the chart. We do have to do the ECG because it. It, it could very well be the ACS, and I think it's really important in this case to do it uh, were you in, a, in another setting. But 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 it doesn't really change our decision right now. In the next couple of seconds to minutes, this is the most important thing. Then the other things comes afterwards, All right? So what do we have to do right now? What are the three tests really important right now? And I, I would argue in this case, not many tests actually are important. We'll have to get the uh, CV, uh, PVK in. I would say ECGs um, do them quickly, um, but I'll call it uh, while well, I call the uh, radiologists and 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 then we'll go, All right? Okay. If we did in this case do all of these things, then we will just have a normal normal uh, test and even draw a blood gas in this example. Um, these are all real test real cases, by the way, and the ECG here. It's really like we're only looking for STEMI here, actually, because that's the only thing that can actually change our decision. There's no STEMI here. Um, the studies have not been done on, on OMI, if you know that terminology. 
So we don't know uh, really, and, I'll, and if my CT scan is really close by, I'll just go there. If it's not close by, then I have to consider and, and discuss with the PCI team if I did have an OMI. Um, yeah. And then you have this scan, and you, I usually draw the like I, I usually talk about this case uh, through the perspective of well, um, you're in the middle of the night, and you this is the old scan from the patient that you have this. Uh, what what are we actually looking at? It's really hard to actually know what you're looking at sometimes. So because we have to look at different scans at different times from different specialities and so on. I'm no radiologist, and so often sometimes during the nighttime you have to look at them themselves. So basics first. This was from the screening test in 2015. This is from now, when we're in 2016. You have this, um, the left side of your uh, your leg. And you, uh, what, what is left and right? Well, this is left, this is right. Mm -hmm. um, and what, then you have some kind of chest here. Um, and you have your um, um, the spine here. Okay, and then you have, I know that the aorta the descending aorta goes beside the spine. That's so that's that's probably the descending aorta with, with contrast, and this is in the ascending aorta. And then you have some kind of um, pulmonary vessels, heart thing here. Okay. Um, so now we kind of have our landmarks. Then we look to the other one, here, or we can see that there's a flap here. That's probably what they talk about the dissection thing. And then here, what's happening here? There's something in around this area here. So what I will do here is, if I look at this scan, I'll just call, uh, I'll, I'll link, the, link the pictures to the hospital that I need to talk with um, in, in, our, in Stockholm, it will be Karolinska. And I'll talk to the thoracic surgeon and say that I think I have a, uh, this condition. The radiologist will not um, come out with a description until 30 minutes later, so I, I have to call you before the description. Could you please take a look at the pictures? I think we have a type A dissection. Yes, and then they'll look at the pictures and so on. So that's that's just one case in chest pain where we go through these these things, and I'll I'll happily um, come back and, and ask uh, and, and talk more with you about these conditions and the two cases. And I'll, I promise you this uh, this um, reference about uh, the one in two hundred. It says here like. While ECG abnormalities in patients with dissection are common, those mimicking acute coronary occlusion are not. Less than 10% of type A di or dissection have new Q waves or ST elevation, making it oncoming occurrence in a rare disease. This should not distract from a far more likely or equally time-sensitive emergency. In a study of in a study of more than 1,500 patients with STEMI, only 0.5 were secondary to aortic dissection. So, with an ECG of acute coronary occlusion, looking for rare condition causes will cause patient harm and more. That's the EM cases at the emergency medicine block. That's their take on this. That, that, that doesn't make it true. Evidence has to be taken in context, in, con, in context. but yeah, there are some evidence out there that actually says that we should probably just do the ECG and go to the PCI lab. So that would prioritize it, but yeah. yeah. And I talked about flying ahead of the plane because we do that all the time. Before ordering a test, what do we do if it's negative? What do we do if it's positive? Yeah. 